I think we're always going to be the underdogs, but I think the type of underdogs you want to be with in a fight, you know, um, we, I, I take a lot of pride and the team as well in outworking people and, and, and just making sure that like where we are today, we will not stop progressing because of the work we put in. It's a continuous growth that, that, that is exciting to be a part of. It is a joy to be here with two truly remarkable, singular human beings, two blokes who were two of the most intelligently ferocious defenders in their own respective sports, capable of handing out biblical smitings on the regs. And I've always said that one of the true joys of the Premier League is the sense of connection that it gives, true global connection that it can create. And this conversation to come is really living proof of that. I've had JJ Watt on our show a bunch of times and I've always admired so deeply how his interest in football moves so fast from a curiosity to a passion to an authentic obsession. And it's been beautiful to watch him follow that passion all the way to Burnley, a town I know so well, having grown up in that neck of the woods. And JJ's talked about being over there and just how much he's enjoyed the town, the club, the fans, the pints. But above all, it's conversations with Burnley manager Vincent Company, a bloke who really needs no introduction to any Premier League fan, but whom it's honestly been thrilling to watch transform Burnley Football Club into a true buccaneering collective on the field, enabling Claret fans around the world to dream off it. I said to JJ when he said, I just had this incredible conversation with Vincent Company. I said, God, I wish we could have taped that conversation. And well, here we are, without further ado, to listen in to them talking about leadership, management, and who makes the best black pudding in Lancashire. It's great to see you, gents, Vince and JJ. We'll get into it. I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, obviously, this is a big American audience here, and we're going to try and introduce them to Burnley and teach them a little bit about Burnley. But more importantly, I want to also just sit down and have a conversation and ask some questions that... I think I would be interested to know if I was a fan and also questions that as when I was a player, what I would want to have asked. So I want to start out with a little bit of Burnley and just yeah. when you were a player, what did you think of Burnley? And now that you're a manager, what is different in what you think about it? Let's put it this way. It had the perception of being a place where you didn't necessarily want it to go too often. You know, you go play your game. It's once a year and it's a little bit like a trip to the dentist. You know, you uh, you go there, but you don't necessarily, you know you're not going to enjoy it. And it was always a club that had this reputation, reputation of definitely overachieving. I don't think for many years that many people thought they belonged in the Premier League. Um, but it was a very particular club, very, very segregated from the rest of the Premier League, if you like. And, and times change, I think, when I got there. The, the feeling I got was, was very different when I got there as a manager from what I had in terms of perception. It was a very open club with very good staff, very good players, just very good people in general. And, and everything was there in terms of the environment, the infrastructure even, to develop, to become better, to, to try and be the best. And, and I, I found that really exciting. And, and I always decided that I was going to make my next move as a coach, as a manager, um, to associate with good people. And I found that straight away. And that's been the reason why I think it just took off like this. Yeah. How have you found that obviously being a player myself and not having transitioned to coaching or managing, how have you found the transition? What is, what is the number one biggest thing that you didn't know before you were a manager that surprised you? I, I think I prepared really well, so I wasn't really surprised. You know, I, I think maybe what, I, what surprised me the most, I would say, though, or, or I was prepared for it, but it still caught me by surprise. It was um, how much of an influence the outside world has on your job and the quality of your job. You're not as much in control as you are when you are a player. When you're a player, you know that if you, when you've had a bad moment, if you keep your head down, in your case, maybe the next tackle could be the one that changes everything. And in my case, it could be a goal. It could be a tackle as well. And you're in control. You just got to be in control of your emotions and you can take care of stuff. When you're a manager, you don't take care of anything when the game is 
is going. I mean, yes, you you change the tactics, you make substitutions, but you kind of let the, the JJ Watt and the Vina company of your team take care of the rest, right? When we're managers and coaches, we're, we're really there to almost assist players in their development. And the thing we have to be the, take a lot of pride in is if a group of players with us develops quicker than with someone else and gets better. And results will come from that. So the results is definitely something we aim for every game. But you, success happens after yeah. behavior for success, right? But you're not surrounded with people all the time in football. And, and Burnley is very different in that sense. But you're not, because you'll understand this, but you're not surrounded with people. We have a lot of understanding of the work that goes into it and the time that you need and the, the ideas that you have and can ju judge you on the quality of your ideas uh, as opposed to um, just the outcome on, a, on one game, you know? That's fascinating to me because that's the one thing that I would imagine is so difficult. When you're playing, you control it. You can do it, but when you're managing, you don't. So how do you handle that? Because let's say you're playing poorly as a player. I can work harder. I can go in the gym. I can train harder. I can do those things. As a manager, you have to try and pull that out of your players. How do you handle that when the team isn't performing how you want them to or a certain player isn't performing? How do you handle that emotion of saying, just getting through to them and saying, I need you to do better? Yeah, but, but you know that it, it's a certain elite of athletes that will always react in the right way in adversity. Most players don't, or they're just normal human beings who are going to have to find out along the way how you have to handle these things. So I think as a coach, what I can do in, that, in those moments is um, create an environment that gives them a chance you know, to, like I said, progress quicker, learn quicker, understand what's going on, why it's not working or why they have done something really well and, and repeat the good things and take away the bad things. And I create the environment and absorb the pressure for the team in many, many ways. Take responsibility, be accountable and give them a feeling that they are supported. I think those are things that I would have liked or that I've had in my careers in good moments that I can remember and that's what you want to provide. Yeah, you talked a little bit about the, the outside perceptions and the media and the supporters. That's one of those things that I think America and England do have slightly differently. We have a lot of fantasy football owners who are yelling at us about not getting enough points for their team. Um, I do think that the, the British media is, is very, very hard and the supporters are very, very hard on the players and the coaches in many ways. Do you, do you think that there's a difference there? And do you think that now that you're a manager, is the media pressure different than when you were a player? I, I don't know. I feel that we we learn to handle it as well. So I've never known anything different. So in 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 in, in my mind, that's the that's kind of the norm. You have to condition yourself to be able to maneuver in that in that world. But I think the big the big thing for me is I I, I do keep a discipline of not letting myself get dragged into any of it because I know last year. You win the league with 101 points, but as we're winning, as we're progressing, as we're getting all the praise, I'm three or four months already prepared for what will come if we lose the first three games, which happens. But I, it's been six months that I've been in my head prepared for like, OK, and you know, then the bubble bursts a little bit and you've got to stay calm and you've got to. And the m main thing is that you keep the group in check, make sure the group believes, make sure the group works hard, make sure the group doesn't get involved in, in anything from the outside. And that's what, that's what we do. And, and then you know as well, then come the victories. It's a matter of time. So how do you handle that right now with the guys when you're giving your team talks or where you're at practice? How do you keep them up, keep them motivated without wearing them thin and saying the same message over and over? Obviously, as you go through a tough stretch, but knowing that you have to keep them motivated to keep them going. I think you prepare it long before. I think your first day of preseason. Even I, I remember when we won the championship last year, I think I was already talking about how we would behave when things got more difficult. Because it is, the level is, you can't compare the level. It's the toughest league in the world, not by some, a little bit of a distance, but by the gap is massive. 
it's like the difference between the Premier League and the other leagues is getting anyway it's yeah. bigger than I've ever known it and, and it, the same is for the difference between Championship and Premier League so you prepare them way before way before and then I, 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 I talk a lot about cycles so the leagues in England every year you get relegated if you don't finish in the, in a, you know above a certain threshold but in reality okay those are the rules of English football but we have to look at it in cycles I think in three years time if we manage to get through this season, then the next season, I think there's a three-year cycle for us where I don't think anyone can imagine how high we can finish. Yes, we have to get through the short term. You can't escape in England. <laughs> there's consequences. But, but believe we can do the short term. And if we take care of the short term, then I think our team has got more to offer than, 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 than people can imagine. One of the questions I wanted to ask is about the European schedule i mean obviously coming from the nfl we play 17 games in a season the schedule that you guys have basically gives you one month off a year and then the whole year you're in it yeah, that's if you're lucky yeah exactly and it's if you have a manager that does two preseasons you also you know it's, it's tough sledding <laughs> but do you like do you like that constant scheduling do you think there is too much for some teams especially at the top do you think that causes injuries how do you feel about it I think for us it's okay, but but for for having played at the very top, I think there it can get a little bit too much, you know. Um, I remember going almost two years without a holiday, nothing. I mean, not even holiday like on the beach, just time off, two years. And that was because we finished the league, won the league, then we had to go to the World Cup and we played semi-finals of the World Cup and finished on... Uh, and then a week later, we had to play what is called the Community Shield, which is the winner of the FA Cup in England and the winner of the Premier League. And then you go again. And then by the end of it, you've had five or six days off and you're going to the very first game of the next season. Crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think at that level, you do want to start looking for like, well, can, can we put a right. cap on the num number of games a player can play? Like, look, play as many games as you want all season, but each player plays 50 games, right. 60 games, whatever it is, and that's it. <laughs> We're not there yet. No, it's tough, man. It is really crazy when I look at it and I see especially the top teams that are playing in all the competitions. I mean, the wear and tear on your body is, over the years especially, is, it's brutal. How has your daily routine changed yeah. from being a player to a manager? Like, do you, do you still train? Do you still go to the gym or do you have no time? Because I know your, your schedule is nuts. I, I try as much. I train today, but it's because we have a day off. I think other than that, no, it's, you can't compare. I think because the kids go to school, I try and be there a little bit in the morning. Uh, but even then, it's, you can't call it quality time. It's just presence. And around 7, seven o'clock, I, I jump in a car. Um, I, have a friend who, I have a friend and colleague who drives me to, to the club, so I get about an hour. I start at 7 o'clock on my laptop, and I can finish any time. You know, sometimes it's just ridiculous hours. It's until bedtime. And, and but I, I love what I'm doing, so I don't complain about it. And and, and I try to make the most of, of these little gaps that I have where I can spend time with the family. But it's football and family. That's it. Does Bellas work out more or you? Training, working out, Bellas. <laughs> Bellas. He looks like it. They almost released him on the on the fourth official at the Man City match when I was there and I was ready to back him up. He's He's like a dog on the sideline. Yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's is is such a calm version of what he used to be as a player. Trust me, is is very calm now and is um is guiding a lot of players through similar situations as he's been through as a player. The one thing I love about Turf Moor is how close that we get to sit to the pitch and right behind you and the in the team. And so I have two questions from my perch on the pitch. Number one, who and how do you decide your match day outfits? I notice you've gone with the blazer sometimes. You've gone with the training kit sometimes. How do you decide? I don't. I'm, I'm last minute. I, I, I'm, I'm really bad for that because I'm thinking of the team. I'm thinking of the tactics. I'm thinking of, you know, putting everything together for training sessions and whatever comes with the job. And then there's a moment where I get a tap on the shoulder and it's like, don't forget this. And then I'm like, oh, right. I scramble whatever I can find, usually too much. And about sometimes, what is it, half an hour before the game, I kind of see what I brought. 
<laughs> it's really bad. And, and you'd expect more of a Premier League manager, but... I thought there was more thought because I noticed like the Blazer last year transitioned in into the training kit and then... I managed to fool you then. <laughs> and then my second question is, and I'm fascinated by this because obviously you've felt the emotion of being a player, so you know all those emotions. But as a manager, sometimes managers act cool when a goal happens or when a bad play happens, managers kind of keep it calm and collected. And sometimes they let out all their emotions. I mean, I've seen you fist pump and run down the sidelines. How do you decide when you let that emotion in or when you decide to play it cool? Um, I, I still don't decide. I think it's a little bit the same as... The same is going through your mind as when you were a player still. There's moments where you feel like one of one of the guys, one of the team. And then there's moments where the first thing that goes through your head is right, organize them, get them focused. This is what we want. It kind of depends. If, if there's a minute left to, to play and you score a goal. Yeah, you're going to let it fly. Emotions just come out. There's, yeah, there's nothing you can do. And as well, I, f I feel sometimes it's almost like almost adding to the energy of your team sometimes, you know. Maybe where I would add the most is if you are, if a team is leading and you get that one goal back just to keep the momentum go going, to make sure that they yeah. understand it's war now, we're coming for you. And, and it's a gamble always because you're not, you don't know, but this is what you want to portray at that moment in time, we're coming back. I had a similar juxtaposition a couple months ago during the parade. Uh, when I came in, obviously now part of the ownership group, I'm no longer a player. I came in, all the boys were getting ready for the parade. Ashley Barnes is playing poker around a table. He's got beers with the boys. He says, JJ, come on <laughs> over and sit down. So like, I'm sitting down. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm in the ownership group, but I am still like the same age as Ashley. And we're still, I'm a player at heart. So we start playing a little cards. I start, I have a beer and he's like, come on, we're going on the bus. And so we get on the bus to go to the parade. And I'm sitting here like, all right. Am I supposed to be enjoying this and having fun or am I not supposed to? But just like, you know, those are the moments that make it so special. Like that day, that parade, everything about that, that you could tell that team was so special. And what you guys created last year, that had to be a special environment with that group. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? I said to the guys, I've been lucky to be associated to many successful teams. But yeah, the perfect season happen maybe once or twice in your career that's if you're lucky you know that season where every and that's if you're very lucky i, I was thinking at 29 30 i'm never going to experience it and it's only in my 30s that i had my first and second season where i was like we're on top of the world we, we are dominating this and we had this feeling at our level and i said to the guys i said you you you're not going to appreciate how rare this is in your career and and make sure that you keep your standards as high as you can until the last game of the season to finish it off the way you started this. It'll take time before any of us have this again. That's the nature of, of this game. It's so competitive. We've, we've talked tactics a little bit before. We've had conversations. We've watched film, which is, that's my favorite thing. That was an incredible experience doing that. Is there anything from the NFL, from other leagues, whether it's rugby, whether it's tennis, golf, is there anything that you've taken that really you think has helped or is there anything you think you still want to learn that could help in the Premier League? Yeah, plenty I still want to learn, but attention to detail, um, hours of education for the players. I think you put in a lot of a lot more time in a classroom, like you would say, than we do. I think there's other things that, that, that are really healthy in football that we need to keep, but I definitely think that we got another layer of levels to come when it comes to players dedicating the day to the profession you know but it's difficult when you only have six days off in a year right <laughs> you, something's got to give so your typical day for a player how long physically are they in the building i'd say on a on a, on a big day they would come in bet between 10 to 4 yeah. you know and that's a big day yeah, yeah 10 to 4 but the, re the reason being as well is like there's only so many hours we can put them on a pitch <laughs> the, the bodies can't take, you know, it, it's, that's literally what it is. And then we, we need to make sure they eat well. We need to make sure they stay disciplined when they go to bed at the right time so that they come back in fresh the next day and they can benefit from the work they did the day before. That's part of the job as well. That's a very tough thing to balance is maximizing everything, but also giving them enough rest. And that's, that's very tough. Uh, I was in the Texans facility yesterday and I was talking to my coaches and about their schedule and 
So they're in from about 6 a.m. And then the players leave about 4.30 p.m. So it's it's a full day on like a Wednesday, Thursday in the season, which is obviously very different. The preseason, so if you t- talk about the off season, we might go longer. Like if you go on training camp or something, we, we can add loads of things, you know, talks with specialists, you know, sleep, sleep specialists, nutritionists. You know, there's loads of little workshops you can bolt onto a day. Um, but on a, on a normal week, uh, I, I think balance is more important than anything because you can't, the weekend, your match is the most important. All right, before we wrap it up, I have some quick questions I want to ask. This is more just fun, silly shit that I want to know personally. I know you speak like seven languages. Rank them one to seven in the most fluent to least fluent. Yeah, so I speak five, I probably understand another two on top of it. So most fluent, I'm supposed to be most fluent in French, but English is coming very close. Wait, wait, you're better at French? That's what I spoke at home, so I hope I am. I didn't I didn't put that together. I'm an idiot. That was... Yeah. But I'm 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 extremely fluent in Dutch as well. So the, the thing that happens when you grow up in Brussels, I spoke French at home and I went to school in Dutch. So go figure that out. So my writing listen, my writing and reading is better in Dutch, but my speaking is better in French. So is Dutch, so do you still speak Dutch better than English because you also had to read and write it, or is Dutch behind English? Yeah, the ranking's changing now. I think, I think English is, is my just creep ahead of Dutch now. That's incredible. That's a, that's a hard, yeah. that's extremely difficult for a child yeah. to be learning all that. But they also say that's the best time to possibly learn. So, all right, what's after those three? So after that comes German. Um, fine. Um, full, full understanding and pretty fluent it says 80 percent but then comes about three languages that i say if you it's the type of language where you say if you put me three months in that country i will speak it and it's italian spanish and portuguese but yeah give me i need three months and then i'll i'll be there with those languages fascinating all right uh the one food that i have to try when i'm in england you've had sunday dinner right sunday roast Yes, I have. I love Sunday roast. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. It's simple, but just beef, Yorkshire pudding, big baked potatoes, whatever. So no, that, that, that's a nice tradition that I like. I need protein. I've learned, I've learned in England that, that it's hard for me to get enough protein. Look, I'm still Belgian, so we, 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 I think we're allowed to criticize English food a little bit. You're, you're jumping ahead to my next question, which is what's the one Belgian food I have to try? Um, I, I like something very simple. We do like um, something as a start, which is um, mushrooms on toast. But the way they do it is with butter and garlic, and it's nicely done. And simple things, simple things are done very well in Belgium. Are you proud of a uh, – this is a very American question. I apologize. Are you proud of the Belgian waffle? And do they eat Belgian waffles in Belgium, or is that just an Americanized thing? No, no, no. We we eat a lot of waffles in Belgium, and we have very different types of waffles as well. Uh, and we're very proud of it. Yeah. So it's something I could have named as well: Belgian waffles, chocolate beer. Very proud of it. What are the different kind of waffles? I'm fascinated. So there's waffles from Liège, which is like a city in Belgium. And there's waffles from Brussels, and you know, and one is more thick and sugary. The other one is more like. I don't know which one you've been eating in, in the fancy fancy restaurants you go to. Oh yeah, yeah, real fancy. No, I make them myself at the <laughs> Holiday Inn. You can flip them over with the thing, and it, it does it itself. If, if it's a, if it's a little bit more chewy and buttery, it's from Liège, and if it's a little bit more dry, it's from Brussels. I'm gonna come to Belgium sometime, and we're gonna do a waffle tour. That's that's gonna be our next show together. <laughs> exactly. Uh, favorite European candy. Oh, just the simple, you know, the strawberry ones, uh, like it's, it's yeah, a Haribo, yeah. literally, you know, those stro- ha- All right. Haribo strawberries. I could eat, um, yeah, packs and packs of it. All right. Favorite drink? Can it be alcoholic? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's the thing. Uh, I like triple caramelite. It's like um, a, a beer from, from Belgium, just, you know. it's. Uh, All right. I'm going to add that to my list. Have you tried a Benny and Hot? Mm, I have smelt it. 
<laughs> that's all you need, man. That's all you need. Unless it's <laughs> cold as hell and snowing outside, that's about all you need. And if you have a cough and you need to get back up for yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, best Premier League away day. Dep- depends what you like. I'll, I've always liked going to Newcastle. I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah, so you've got the fancy stadiums with you know obviously Tottenham Stadium is unbelievable, and then but Newcastle is. Um, yeah, it's 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 very weirdly built as well. You've got one side which is absolutely huge. It could be like an NFL stadium, and then the other side which is like a uh, looks like a very traditional, like almost like turf more like type of shape. Um, but it's loud and um, and as well, I think one side you attack you're attacking uphill. What? Yeah, yeah. Shut so up. You, you got to choose your. No way. Like I. I... It blew my mind when I found out that Premier League pitches could be different sizes. That blew my mind. Now you're telling me that there's an uphill and a downhill side? Yeah, yeah. In some clubs, it's like you you have to know whether you're going uphill first or or downhill first. It makes a big difference. (laughs) So what do you change as a manager when you're going downhill versus uphill? Uh, I... For some reason, I remember always second half going uphill. But for me, when I was at Man City, we've had some strong teams, so we've had some very good away days there, and it's just been. But but it's a, it's it can be a tough place and windy as well. So what do you like if we're going downhill? Do you tell do you tell Trafford, hey, you got to take a couple, take a little bit off of this one, otherwise it's going to roll all the way out. Uh, no, because it doesn't do as much. It's more the running. So if you finish going downhill. If you have momentum, it's, yeah. it, I got to go to St. James Park. I have to see this. I have to see this in person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, they, they, they have a lot of money now, so they might have fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> Flattened it out. Yeah, but you had everything. You used to have pitches who, who used to curve to let the water off. Yeah. The Chiefs have that. That's, that's an NFL thing, too. Um, best changing room in the Premier League? Tottenham. It's like... But yeah, they're made for they're made for Beyonce and the superstars that are coming to for the concert. Beautiful. What is the worst? Is it our own, the away one? No, 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 no. Um, Luton Town. Yeah, the, and nothing comes close. I'm so mad I missed that game because I was scheduled to be at that one, and then it got postponed. I don't think you would fit in the stadium, JJ. <laughs> I was gonna climb over the rooftops and come in. <laughs> it's but it's a spe- that's what I love about England as well. I think Luton now uh, everything as well that makes the Premier League different. You know, it's uh, you go to Tottenham and then you go to Luton, and you might as well be in a different sport. And for us, it was it was nice experiencing all these stadiums last season as well. That's yeah. So you say that's obviously the worst. I'm assuming it's just tiny. You couldn't fit in there. Yeah, but you, you like to me as well. It's a character test for the players. It's like. Yeah. Do not dare to complain. Get on with it. You know, embrace it, and and if anything, like make it something, yeah. make it your strength when you go out there. That's a, that's a big thing for me. And then the last thing before I let you go, and I appreciate this very much. This has been great. If you're talking to a new Premier League fan in America, and you're trying to convince them why Burnley, obviously that's kind of my whole job with this club is to to bring on new Premier League fans and bring them to Burnley. What would you say as to why they should support Burnley? First of all, hardworking, good people that are not afraid to push boundaries. And, and I think we're always going to be the underdogs, but I think the type of underdogs you want to be with in a fight, you know. Um, we, I, I take a lot of pride and the team as well in outworking people and, and, and just making sure that like where we are today, we will not stop progressing because of the work we put in. It's a continuous growth that, that, that is exciting to be a part of. Listen to the full version of this podcast and all our podcasts wherever you get your pods. But first, subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage.